As much as I don't like getting hate mail, sometimes I have to tell the truth about how I healed from the severe symptoms of childhood PTSD. And in some people's book, I did it wrong, namely because I abandoned talk therapy. And even just a few years ago, this was an unthinkable thing to say. People called me stupid, uneducated, selfish, misguided, greedy, irresponsible. They even called me dangerous. But since then, maybe accelerated by the pandemic and all the problems that that made worse in people, huge numbers of medical and mental health professionals have come around to listen and learn from the conversation happening here at Crappy Childhood Ferry. Not just the videos I make where I teach how I healed, but the comments where thousands and thousands of people like you share their knowledge and experience having CPTSD, what it's like to get stuck, what it's like to get unstuck and feel better. So here I'm sharing the video that was my opening salvo early in crappy childhood fairy history called Why I Quit Therapy. Something that people say all the time when you tell them you're struggling with depression or stress or your relationship, they say that you should go talk to someone, or they say you should find a good therapist. Well, for me, talk therapy, even with good therapists, did more harm than good. And even though there are hundreds of therapists who come to this channel or my courses, I'm friends with many of them, I respect the work they're doing, I'm glad they're out there helping people, I wanna tell you why therapy didn't work for me. And I've mentioned this on the channel before, and I got some really angry comments from a few people, but I got about 20 times more appreciative comments because my experience is very similar to what a lot of people with past trauma go through when they try to do the normal thing that is recommended that you do, go talk to a therapist. And it needs to be okay to talk honestly about this. So I wanna tell you wh why I quit therapy and while this is not to say I think you should quit therapy, I wish that I'd quit it years before I did. And I really couldn't until I had something else in place that worked better for me. So I'm gonna talk about what that was too, what did work, because on a practical level, I really did need support and help. So first, if you're in therapy and it helps you, you have my 100% encouragement, just keep doing that. I've known many, many people who find therapy to be positive and transformative. It's a place of healing for them. They love their therapists so much they can't imagine how anyone could have a different experience. Well, I wanted that positive experience, but what I got was something different. And now I know why, and it makes total sense. But I didn't know why back then, and it was crushing me. It made me feel so broken and alone, the way everyone just assumes, oh, it's so great, talk therapy, I love it, you know, it's so helpful. And it just wasn't for me. So here's how the story started. My aunt and uncle paid for me to go to my first therapy visit when I was 14. I was having a really hard time, and my dad was dying at the time. He had ALS, and I was really struggling, and they sent me, and I just remember, it felt really yucky. I felt really judged. Um, I got very upset. I tried to hide how upset I was. And the way that that felt yucky is very similar to the way that I felt yucky every time I ever tried therapy over the next couple of decades. Now, all in all, I saw 11 different therapists and several of them for a year or more. I really gave it an honest try. I did a lot of research. I talked to people about who's good. Some of them were, you know, they were like professors and institutions that are very esteemed. And a couple of them turned out to be, you know, really capable people. All of them were well-trained. All of them were kind. All of them were sincere in their willingness to hang in there with me. Two of the therapists, and this was, you know, maybe like five years ago or a little more, I scheduled appointments for EMDR and then um, a very famous professional in the field of CPTSD to get some advice for this channel. And those were the only two who I ever talked to who really knew anything about complex PTSD and how to handle it and how it works. And this makes sense because the science about CPTSD really wasn't out yet. It hasn't been out long. It's still not really well you know, distributed among therapists and clinicians out there. But even when I went to see the experts in the field, talking with them about my trauma was a really miserable experience for me. In, in both cases, it cost me about three days of any ability to focus or work or express myself clearly, either speaking or writing. That's how much talk therapy negatively affects me. 
So there's a word for what happens to me when I talk about traumatic experiences. It's called dysregulation. It's a brain and nervous system sort of state where brain waves and body rhythms, they just get really like warped. They get screechy and warped. They get out of sync. They get irregular. And in some cases, this disrupts physiological and cognitive processes too. Now I talk a lot about dysregulation in a lot of my other videos. I have a playlist all about it. I have a whole online course about it. It appears in all my online courses. It's a big thing of how I understood what was actually wrong with me. But just in case you're new to my channel or this concept, I'll just say that when I'm dysregulated, it can feel like sensory overload. Or sometimes it can feel like just like nothing, very flat, very blank. So I get numb and clumsy. I have trouble stringing words together when I'm dysregulated. My handwriting changes. And if people ask me a whole bunch of questions really fast, I will just get completely overwhelmed. I'll have to like leave the room. If I'm asked to talk about hard things that happened in the past, I feel like I want to talk about it. It's like attractive to do that, but very soon after I begin, my ability to be present or focused, it just flies out the window. So I've often described it being dysregulated, like, like wearing headphones with really loud, chaotic music just blasting in my ears. And then I'm trying to pretend that I'm right here and everything's fine. And oh yeah, I can hear you, but I can't. It's, you know, it's like really overriding my senses, but almost all my energy and focus goes into acting normal in those situations. So it's really difficult. I used to think everybody felt this way when they went to therapy. And I was told, you know, when I'd say, yeah, God, you know, I'm really stressed out. My heart's pounding. I can't think they go. Yeah, it, it tends to, it can sometimes feel worse before it feels better. And so I'd come in with some normal size life challenge. And within the course of the hour, I would just kind of deteriorate into confusion and crying. Everything would feel much worse. And I'd be a wreck for days. And then the next week I'd come back and by then I was composed and I'd say, yep, yeah, I felt better and I was felt hopeful. And I'd try to continue the conversation. And by the end of the hour, it'd be like the headphones again. So I could talk about my feelings, but my feelings would just sort of break loose and scramble everything. And whatever point I was making would get completely lost. I'd feel more and more angry until it felt more like a rant than anything therapeutic. And I would secretly be feeling really defensive because every comment or question began to feel just like bombardment, like getting pecked by birds in the face. And it was too much. <laughs> I was always treated kindly while this went on and therapists accepted this reaction as me just, you know, like dealing with my stuff. But the life problems that had me seeking therapy, most of them were problems of my own making at that point. I did have a rough childhood, but by the time I was, you know, in my thirties, I was kind of generating the problems. Well, we never got to the point where I got any substantial help with those problems, not even after a year or two years. And this is a slightly different reason why therapy didn't feel helpful to me. We definitely never looked really into my role in my problems. And I had some dramatic childhood trauma and we talk on and on about that. But the people who did that were dead or not in my life. And in present time, I had problems of my own that were sabotaging my life and hurting other people. And it seemed like there was a big taboo on helping me face these problems, which did turn out to be the real cause of my distress. And the one part of the big mess of past trauma and current problems, you know, where they intersect, they, they get you stuck there. Your underlying complex PTSD and then the problems you're creating, like if you can't break that up, it just goes on and on and you know, you're a runaway train. Usually I just find what people can fix first, it was certainly true for me, is the stuff that I'm doing right now. So owning my part in all of this was incredibly empowering and healing, but I noticed that therapists would discourage me from going there. I think they thought that I was beating myself up or victim blaming. And there was a lot of encouragement to talk about the wrongs that other people did to me, you know, going on some premise that if I explored these stories enough, some transformation would come about. And I guess, you know, my personal life problems would take care of themselves, but it didn't work that way. It was the opposite. I was drowning in these angry stories. There was nothing to learn from them anymore. Retelling them was totally dysregulating me. So one strategy I had just to try to keep the conversation going towards something that would help me 
is I started avoiding telling therapists just how badly I was feeling inside. And I felt like I couldn't afford to deal with all their feelings about that and all the, the way they would need me or the way I expected them to need me, you know, to make me talk about that. So I was going to therapy talking about, you know, this level of problem, which was like outside stuff, other people, when really I had this problem down here, feeling really bad about myself. And keep in mind, I would start with every one of these therapists telling the real story, where I really was, but it just always seemed like there was this like, you know, sucking noise, this thing that always pulled the focus back to my mom, what happened? And solutions, they would be referenced like, you know, oh, they describe a happy state, but they couldn't tell me how to get there. And I started thinking they might not actually know how to be happy or how to get there from where I was. And I think in some cases that was true. So there was this one period where I was beginning to think seriously that I didn't want to live anymore. And I was not thinking straight, but at the time, I didn't trust that telling a therapist about my dark thoughts would do anything but make things worse for me emotionally. And it's not their fault that I was secretive like that, but in the end, considering what happened when I tried to open up, I just didn't feel safe to be honest with therapists. And that does kind of defeat the purpose. <laughs> so the science of trauma and the signs that, that trauma is what's activated in a person, it just wasn't out there yet. I was a classic case, it was very obvious, but it wasn't known, so again, it's not their fault. But I wish those therapists had had future vision so that they could see that, you know, gosh, that talking about traumatic memories on and on like that was not helping me. It was destroying me. I needed another way. So I remember at the end of every session, it was always time to write a check. And no therapist ever seemed to notice how much I struggled to do this one simple thing. You open the checkbook. This is like a thing of the past, but that's how it was then. You write their name, you write the date, you write the amount, you spell out the amount, you sign your name, you tear it out and you give it to them. And my hands would be shaking. My handwriting was illegible. I'd get all discombobulated and get the wrong things on the wrong spaces. I'd have to tear up three or four checks before I could get one right. These are classic overt signs of dysregulation. So I didn't know what it was either, but they never said anything. I would feel embarrassed to, you know, to just be such an idiot trying to do something so simple. And I, yeah, I was embarrassed to look like I didn't have it together. But now I just want to go back and hug myself and say, it's okay. When you feel this way after something that's supposed to help you and it's not helping you, it's okay to feel bad. I would feel so bad. I just go out in my car every week and cry and wonder, you know, what is wrong with me? And I, it was sometimes be 45 minutes before I could pull myself together enough to drive. They didn't know. I didn't know. I had childhood PTSD. That's what it was. And just like so many people who have what I have, I was dysregulated. And maybe you have that too. And maybe you're hearing this for the first time. And this is a known thing. It's not just me now. This is real. And if you're identifying, I just hope that you feel the huge, warm wave of relief that I felt when I learned that that's why all this talk therapy never helped me. I did get help, yay. I got help and I recovered. I stumbled on what worked for me. And maybe, and I'd really like it if this were the case, I can save you all those years of stumbling so that you can find more quickly the kinds of professional help and self-help that work for you. So I'm going to tell you just so you know what worked for me. And I teach this in my online courses if you want the full story and to be walked through it. But in a nutshell, I was able to process my trauma through techniques that didn't require telling stories. I'll tell you this, the smaller one first. There are two. And then the really big one. The smaller, quicker solution that helped me was EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And that's a technique considered legitimate and effective for many people, not everybody. And it can help to change the triggered reaction that you get to traumatic memories. When I tried it, my practitioner didn't make me tell the stories. He said, think of the traumatic memory, what you saw, what happened, you thinking about it, okay. And then we proceeded without me ever having to tell the details of that memory at all. And it worked. I mean, it worked like mad. It worked in one session. Did you know that? EMDR doesn't require you to talk about hard things at all. It can work anyway. Some practitioners will try to make you talk, but if you're like me, you might want to find one that doesn't make you 
describe it. You just can think of it. So that's cool. So the second thing, the, the big thing, is that I lucked into the writing technique that's part of the daily practice that I teach. It's a free online course. I talk about it all the time. I always put a link to it. It's on the free tools page of my website. The free tools page is linked in the description section. The daily practice course itself is linked in the description section. I try to make it really easy to find. And the woman who showed it to me, she told me, she said, write your fears and resentments on paper. And this is a very specific technique. And she said, then follow it with a simple restful meditation. She said, do this twice a day, morning and evening, and then periodically call her and read to her what I wrote. So I did. And that's a whole nother story. If you take the free course, I tell you the whole backstory on how I found this, what happened. Okay. So I could write about my trauma, no problem. And it turns out I could read what I wrote also with no problem. So I was able to share what was hurting me without having to just tell stories. And when I called her, she'd say, did you write today? And she'd make me just read, not tell her off the top of my head what was on my mind. Now, she, she didn't know about trauma then either. She was doing this for other reasons. We just knew that it, it was incredibly helpful. Now, there are many reasons why this was brilliant, but especially in my case, it saved me from talking about trauma reading to her once in a while and writing my fears and resentments several times a day always made me feel better, more composed, more regulated. Now, remember, I didn't have a name for dysregulation and I didn't even know that I had CPTSD. I thought I was just a problem person. I thought I was just messed up and it would be years before I had words for what the problem was or for the radically healing effect that this technique had on me. But I knew from day one, I wanted to keep doing it. So flash forward to the present. I'm still using these techniques and teaching them to other people. It's the foundation of what I'm doing on my YouTube channel and on my website and in my courses. And at the time that I'm taping this, more than 300,000 people have connected with me to learn it. That is so many. I get literally hundreds of mails and comments every week with expressions of gratitude and amazement, how helpful it is. And I do free calls on Zoom twice a month for anybody who's taken the course and we use the techniques and I answer questions about how to make it work better. And now many of my students, they're teaching others. And like in the membership program that I have, we have peer led daily practice calls like three, four times a day. It's incredible. So now they're teaching others and answering questions and spreading this wonderful daily practice all over the world. And I can hardly express how happy it makes me just to like witness a another person have that like emergence from their trauma symptoms. I've seen it happen so many times. It is such a joy to witness. And it's, it's always just such a wonderful surprise. Like it really, it really can work. And, and to experience that freedom and to, you know, share that with somebody else, like, yes, it feels so good. And to have your emotions and to have connectedness with other people and clarity in your mind and patience inside and a calmness. And it makes it possible to become who you really are and to pursue anything you want to in your life. It doesn't mean you get it, but you're free to pursue and to cope with whatever may come. It's a tremendous power and freedom. I get a tiny bit of critical mail sometimes. <laughs> sometimes it's just regular old hate mail. You know, you go online and people just say things. But I've gotten a few angry mails from therapists saying things like, you should know that people with trauma must only work through these issues in the care of a licensed therapist. And so in case you don't know, I'm not a therapist or doctor. I'm just somebody who, you know, has been showing these techniques to people for 28 years and healing my own self. And I teach what I know and I read books. So I do what I do. But sometimes they say flat out, who do you think you are to try to help people? And uh, they say I'm dangerous. And I feel really confident, you know, that's, that's just not true. I know who I am. Here's who I am. I'm someone who suffered with childhood PTSD to the point that it was life threatening. And even though conventional methods of treatments didn't work for me, I persevered and I found techniques that do work for me. I experiment. I try many things as new techniques come out. I read. I offer help to other people around the world who relate to my story and ask me. People who feel desperate, those are my people. And I just consider it my mission to just keep teaching people everything I know about how you can calm and heal your symptoms. So to genuinely be helpful to other people, I have to be honest about what it was like before my healing 
That's not always been my favorite part. It can feel very exposed sometimes. I talk about what it was like when I tried to heal and how healing ended up happening. And it's still happening. Um, I'm not done. No one really ever is. And I talk about how I'm still imperfect now. But I'm so much better than I would have settled for back when I had only therapy as a way to deal with what I was going through. I would have settled for 20% as happy as I am right now. Like that would have done the trick back then. And I couldn't even get that. And the end result, which is what we have here, is so much more than some online chat or some blabbing on video. <laughs> if it feels like that to you, I'm sorry. But Crappy Childhood Fairy is so much more than that. It's a place where people from every part of the world come to learn from each other and help each other. It's not just a bunch of videos, it's a movement. It's a revolution. And thankfully, many of the most passionate supporters and contributors of knowledge are therapists and doctors and psychiatrists and social workers and teachers and parents and writers and social media influencers. It's a movement that recognizes healing as the outcome we want, not just treatment, not the preservation of old rules and ideas about who's in charge of healing. I'm in charge of my healing. You are in charge of your healing. We ask professionals for guidance and we ask survivors for guidance. And when it doesn't serve, we try something else. Thank God for everyone who is drawn to this cause into the service of helping one another to heal. I bless the therapist for everything that, that you have tried for dedicating your life to the service of healing, for getting us this far, for being part of everything we're now learning. We're not just victims and we're not just patients or populations or at-risk youth or whatever label denies each of us of the dignity and the individuality and the sovereignty that we each have over our own healing. Whew, I still feel nervous when I hear myself saying the words and telling the truth about how I actually healed from my trauma. It started as a confession of mine here on YouTube, and I was really nervous then when I first put that video out there. Now it feels more like a genuine movement, and there are so many people with me, with professionals and people who seek professional help, people who have professional help. We have doctors, we have people who would never have access to a doctor. We're all here together. We are leaders, we're visionaries, we are warriors for change. It hasn't been good enough, the treatment that's available for trauma. The information has not been accurate enough. It's coming out, but it's not well integrated yet. So we're the pioneers. Those of us who are in this movement all have tremendous potential to be more than we are right now, to find solutions even though things are not totally clear yet. This is a movement to redefine healing from just simply not being depressed so much to a definition of healing that includes the restoration of our intelligence, a definition of healing that includes connection to other people, where that capacity felt like it was permanently damaged before, and a definition of healing that includes the discovery of our real purpose in this world, to become fully ourselves, our real selves, and to bring the gifts that we have into the world where they are so badly needed. That, my friends, is what healing really is. And it is bigger than any of us used to think was possible. But here we are, so many of us are living it. And I am happy and proud to be a voice in this movement. And so if you're still wondering, who the hell do I think I am to say what I say and teach this radical path of healing, I'll tell you who I am. I'm a person who recovered from the symptoms of complex PTSD. That's who I am. And I've devoted my life to teaching other people how to do it too, whether or not they have access to professional help. If you want to get started with the techniques that saved my life back in 1994, it would be my honor to share them with you. It's a short, free online course called The Daily Practice, and you can access it right here. And I will see you very soon.